lost friends, loved ones. We will ensure it was not in vain. We may be the only ship left, but we will not go down without a fight. Let this storm carry us home. Patrick, thank you very much for joining us here today at BAFTA. You're soon to be doing a lecture about Battlefield 4 and the development of it. And mm -hmm. here today, I'd just like to get a little bit more into the depth of how this game was created and how it was made. Can you talk us through how the project went from the initial beginnings to the fully fledged game that it is now and will imminently be? Well, thanks for having me. Uh, well, in general, you know, when building a game like Battlefield 4, it's, it's you know, it's not the first Battlefield game that we've built. So uh, the hard balance is actually to understand where you're coming from so you don't ruin what Battlefield is for a lot of players. We have still have millions of players playing Battlefield 3 at the moment. So to us, it's very important to, to give people kind of what they want. Uh, but on the other hand, you want to bring something new to the table. You want to create something that feels new and fresh and unique. Um, and of course, on top of that, we have the very exciting uh, thing with adding two new consoles to the mix. You know, the PlayStation uh, 4 and the Xbox One is releasing more or less at the same time as the game. So to us, that has been a very exciting journey as well. As a studio, you're renowned for your technological expertise mm -hmm. with Frostbite and also your kind of your creative stuff, like some of games like Mirror's Edge have mm -hmm. very bold creative visions. Um, how does the kind of the technology side and the creative side of the work all occurring within mm. this one studio, how do those different sort of elements influence each other? Um, I think everyone wants to do their best. You know, people look at games from many different angles, like I mentioned, um, and we all want to create the best possible game. There's no one at the studio that doesn't you know, fight or strive towards a better game experience. Um, and in general, you know, sometimes we have to hold people back a bit because there's sometimes too much creativity and, and you, you need to also manage the project so you actually get it into the stores at some time at least. Um, so, so to us it's a very dynamic process and I usually tell people that when they ask about how is it to work at DICE, well it feels like every day is your first day with the work <laughs> because everything is changing and everything is uh, moving um, uh, more or less uh, at the same time um, which is very very exciting but also it's uh, it's a bit nerve-wracking at times the pacific central command is gone if there's anything left of our fleet they're out there blind as bats i don't think we've seen the worst yet we need everyone alive and combat ready i don't trust her she's hiding something <laughs> DICE is quite an important and interesting studio in the way you guys have handled this in that so the single player element of Battlefield 4 is a very kind of coherent, focused narrative experience for one person. And then the multiplayer element of the games is kind of this sporting experience that seems very different in a way, yet they're both developed by the DICE team. How do those sort of two elements kind of interact with each other as you're developing the game and, and how much kind of do they influence each other? Well, first of all, the, the goal for us is to, in one way, create a very different experience. Like you say, it's a narrative, single player, focused experience in, in, in contrast to the, the multiplayer, which is, to your point, a sport. Uh, but if you look at the core elements of both single player and multiplayer, they are the same. It's the same controls, it's the same you know, gadgets and vehicles and weapons, etc. And it's the same... Uh, fantasy, it's the same style and tone, it's the sa same world, so to speak. And then there are some elements that are completely unique for the two. Uh, and then we, of course, have teams that are working separately with these uh, unique uh, things uh, for multiplayer and single player. And then we have a big group of people that work with what's common for the two. Um, and to us, I think it's very healthy to be working with both because it's very easy for us to to forget about the one when we're working with the other and vice versa. I think uh, some of the elements that we're introducing with Battlefield 4, like the Levolution concept, actually comes from the idea of uh, how exciting it is in single player when all of these cool, you know, epic events happens and all of these small things you can do and all these um, almost narrative uh, elements, gameplay elements that you do. Uh, why can't you do that in multiplayer? And then this concept came up with 
uh, creating a dynamic world where things can actually change as you're playing the map and it can be player driven, both the small things and the big things. Having this um, kind of flexible way of thinking about multiplayer and single player and what is great about both, uh, I think gives us more opportunity to create even an even better gaming experience. Hey, I've just got one more question. When, you, when you've made these games, obviously there's so much work that goes into creating the game pre-release, but then post-release, it becomes a very different, but equally time-consuming yes. <laughs> thing to work on. Once, the, once one of these games, particularly your really the big games, the Battlefield series, mm -hmm. when they're out and you, you start to look at how people are playing them and the metrics and stuff, I'm interested in what, what stuff is it that you're measuring? What data do you gather from your players, both in terms of metrics and player feedback? And how does that kind of influence what you're doing next? I think what you're bringing up is, you know, the telemetry we gather and also, you know, looking at forums and you know, listening to consumers in general is, is a big source uh, that we're using to both uh, tweak and tune our games post-launch, but also looking at what we should do for the future. Um, to us, that's, you know, key. Uh, of course, we need to look at ourselves from a creative vision, what we want to create, but in general, it's very important to actually test your vision against real players. And I think that that's the benefit of, of online games. You can actually do that. You know in real time what's going on. You can actually change things some, in some cases in real time to see if it works, uh, which means that we are trying to evolve that uh, kind of in the background um, so that the players will actually get a more uh, interesting and living service. And I guess you've kind of already started doing that with the beta mm -hmm. and everything. Yes. Um, so when you say you're changing things in real time, mm -hmm. this is an exciting idea. D is it a kind of a, like A-B testing? Do you like test a new thing on a small fraction of the player base and then see how they respond? We, we can do that. We, we, uh, we are sometimes updating servers in that way. So you know, a couple of servers get an update first, we see if it works, and then we roll that out to the other servers. And of course, when you do that server side, the players won't notice because they just log, log on to the game and there are some changes. Um, and I think to us that's very, very important that we can actually change the game and tweak the game and make it better without kind of stopping the player in, its, in their, pa in, in their s uh, path. Uh, because uh, players just want to play the game and have fun. It's our job to make sure that the game is you know, um, on par with, with the expected experience. Well, Patrick, thank you very much for coming in and talking to us today. Thank and you I hope that that post-launch experience is a smooth one for you and the team. Yes, so, so do we. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you.